Good morning and welcome to Breakfast with Ben Thompson and Victoria Fritz. Our headlines this morning, new powers to stop and search for the police in England and Wales. The Home Secretary says it will tackle violent crime, but opponents call it too intrusive. With Theresa May's cabinet split over its next steps on Brexit, all eyes are on tomorrow's vote by MPs on alternative options. Some of the world's most famous landmarks are plunged into darkness to draw attention to climate change. In sport, it's farewell to Huddersfield, relegated from the Premier League, the joint earliest in the league's history. And could this be coming to a street near you? The barbershop in the back of a van. And after seeing 20 degrees yesterday, most of you will be lucky to see 9 degrees as we go through the next few days. The cool down starts today. I'll have all the details right here on Breakfast. Good morning to you. It is Sunday the 31st of March. And yes, don't forget the <laughs> clocks have gone forward overnight. It is just after six. Uh, you're very welcome to breakfast this morning. And our top story today, new stop and search powers are being given to police in England and Wales to try and tackle rising knife crime. The Home Secretary, Sajid Javid, is making it easier for officers to intervene where they think serious violence may occur. But opponents say it's intrusive and won't work. Our Home Affairs correspondent, Danny Shaw, has this. Another knife off the streets. This three and a half inch blade was found when a young man was stopped and searched in North London. Now police in the seven areas worst affected by knife crossing rules brought in when Theresa May was Home Secretary. The whole government agree that stop and search is a vital power. We still, of course, want it to be targeted and focused and intelligence led, which it will be. But with these new powers, these increased powers, we all agree, including the Prime Minister, this is exactly what is needed to help fight the rise in serious violence. Under the changes, police will be able to search anyone in areas where they believe serious violence may occur. Police inspectors can approve the powers rather than more senior officers. Police say stop and search acts as a deterrent, helping to prevent violence and keep weapons off the streets. But it's an intrusive tactic and highly controversial. Too many of my experiences and stories I've heard um, has been very unpleasant, which leads to building a lot of tension between police and the young people to the point where you have young innocent civilians running away from police just to avoid being stopped and searched. But for the vast bulk of knife searches police conduct, they need reasonable suspicion that someone is carrying a weapon. And those powers remain the same. Danny Shaw, BBC News. Now it's thought Theresa May is waiting to see what happens when MPs vote on a series of alternatives to her Brexit plan tomorrow before deciding her next move. Several prominent Brexiteers have urged the Prime Minister to walk away without a deal rather than delay or soften Brexit. So let's speak now to our political correspondent Jonathan Blake who's in central London for us. Jonathan, just how important is this vote tomorrow? It's hugely important not only for Parliament to have another chance at finding a consensus for an alternative Brexit plan, but also as an indication of what the government might do next, because this morning it's simply not clear what Theresa May's next steps will be. She's said to be having conversations this weekend, and we're told it remains Downing Street's ambition to try to get the Brexit deal that she has agreed with the EU through Parliament with one more vote. But as we know, it's been defeated twice in full and once in part with the withdrawal agreement suffering another loss for the government in Parliament last week. So this morning, as I say, the next steps for the Prime Minister are not clear, but she is facing pressure from all sides as ever. Conservative Brexiteers urging her to pursue a no deal Brexit now, plus those who prefer a softer Brexit and a closer relationship in future also adding pressure to the Prime Minister this morning. Isn't it just? Uh, Jonathan, for now, thank you. More from Jonathan a little later. Uh, an anti-stall system has been blamed for the fatal crash of the Boeing 737 MAX aircraft in Ethiopia earlier this month. Sources involved say the investigations say the black box shows that the nose of the plane was pushed down by the system before it crashed, killing all 157 people on board. 
The founder of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, says regulators and the government should play a more active role in controlling content on the internet. Writing in the Washington Post, he says the responsibility for policing content is just too great for firms alone. He's now called for new laws in areas including harmful content and election integrity. Uh, there's been a sharp rise in the number of adults calling a national helpline for the children of alcoholic parents. This is according to figures seen by the BBC. Yeah, in 2013, the majority of requests were from children, but now more than 80% of calls are from people over the age of 18. Well, let's speak to Adrian Goldberg, who's from Five Live Investigates. He's been looking into this for us. Adrian, just explain these figures, because they seem a b very different. It traditionally would have been children, now it's older Absolutely, people. Absolutely, and it's a remarkable change. So these figures have come from NACO, the National Association for the Children of Alcoholic Parents. And back in 2013, as you say, the majority of their calls were from children. Uh, they got about 6,000 odd calls each year from adults. By 2018, the number of calls from adults had absolutely rocketed to more than 23,000, so around three and a half times the rate that they were getting from adults in 2013. And as you say, that now accounts for 80% of their caseload. So why do you think that is? Do you think it's because there are more people looking at their parents who are perhaps older in life, they're perhaps retired and they're, they're turning to alcohol later on in life? Is well, that what's going on? There is definitely a bit of that going on. I think there was also a switch on moment in 2015 when a number of high profile people like the MP Liam Byrne spoke as adults about their experience of living with an alcoholic as a child. That takes a lot of courage to do because there's a kind of stigma and shame associated in many people's minds with alcoholism particularly if it involves your parent so we've had more people coming forward to talk about their childhood experiences of alcoholism now that they are adults but also as you say yes definitely this phenomenon of more older people turning to drink perhaps because they're lonely perhaps because they've lost a job perhaps because they've suffered a bereavement and mm -hmm. that does appear to be a real growing trend as well Okay, Adrian, for now, thanks very much. Thanks, um, and a reminder, of course, you can hear more about that story. That's on BBC Five Live Investigate. It's, it's at 11 o'clock this morning. And just after 8, we're also going to talk to the daughter of one alcoholic father. She's also a trustee of the National Association for the Children of Alcoholics, really to get a sense of what that means and what impact that had on her life. That's just after 8 o'clock. Now, more than £200 million is being handed to the councils of England as part of the government's plans to improve road surfaces. The Department of Transport says the money could help local authorities resurface more than a thousand miles of road. A report published last week warned that councils in England and Wales would need to spend nearly £10 billion over a decade to bring all the roads up to scratch. It's another £200 million to repair potholes. It's enough to re-tarmac a road from London to Edinburgh and back. Uh, it's part of the financial support that's been rolled out over the last few months, 400 million extra in the budget. But we're also uh, now really driving to improve the technology used to repair potholes. This money can't just be used to patch and mend. We've got to do a better job. We've got to hold utility companies to account, and we're putting in place measures to do that. People are frustrated with broken down roads, and we've got to change that. Chris Grayling there. Now, uh, some wonderful pictures for you now of uh, some of the world's most famous landmarks that have been plunged into darkness, all to draw attention to climate change. It is the annual Earth Hour event. Take a look at these. And the global campaign aims to raise awareness about the impact that we're all having on the planet. Now, it started in Australia in 2007. And now, as you can see, observed in more than 180 countries. So last year, over 10 million people across the UK also took part in this. The WWF says that Earth Hour has helped them uh, to influence climate policy in Russia, Argentina, Ecuador and Wales. Uh, Sydney there, one of the uh, last pictures in our sequence, but the Opera House plunged into darkness <laughs> for Earth Hour. Uh, we'll uh, show you some more of those, paper, uh, those pictures a little later. But we're going to take a look at the front pages of the newspapers for you this morning. Starting with the Sunday Times that, no surprise, has Brexit as its lead story. The Prime Minister's Cabinet faces collapse, it says, with resignations expected if she calls for a snap election or alternatively backs a customs union with the European Union. If we move on to the Observer, and furious Conservatives could try to block a snap election bid by Mrs May. This is uh, according to the Observer. The paper also reports that teachers are taking a 7,000 pay cut at one cash-strapped school in London just to save jobs. So lots more on the Observer there. 
In what it calls the final trap for Brexit, the Sunday Express says MPs could strip away the benefits of Brexit if Parliament votes to keep the UK in a customs union in the next round of votes tomorrow. Now we're going to have a full look through the papers with our newspaper reviewer a little later on the programme. We'll delve inside because there is a lot in the papers other than Brexit, but of course Brexit dominating most of the front page. I don't know what you could possibly be talking about then. <laughs> mm. Let's move on. Transgender people experiencing transitioning differently. For some, being able to live truly as they want can provide profound relief, but for others, the process can be very difficult and lonely. Yes, yeah, so to mark the 10th anniversary of International Transgender Day of Visibility, our LGBT correspondent Ben Hunt has been to meet two trans people who've got very different stories. A dark eyeshadow, a dark tone, a mid tone, and a light tone. Meet Annabelle. This is pan stick, cover stick. She's a 63 year old Not transgender first. woman living in Carmarthen in Wales. Last year, she transitioned to being a full time female. This period of my life is the best period of my life. It's because I haven't got to pretend to anyone. I'm me, like it, leave it, accept me, don't accept me. It's not my problem. Annabelle works a few mornings a week as a cleaner. Before she transitioned, she spent decades hiding her true self. She lived a double life. I come from a generation where being trans was the equivalent of being a paedophile. So it was never talked about when I was younger. The decision to transition wasn't an easy one. It was um, a culmination of a lifetime of denial. Like one night I'd be, um, had this elaborately constructed image of a male biker and the next night I'd be dolled up to the eyeballs going to a, a gay club in Brum and no one set of friends knew about the other set of friends. An oil and canvas which helped Annabelle's love of painting and the support of her son got her through the shame and guilt she felt. It was tough at the beginning, but if you just sort of get past your own sort of internal prejudice and it just becomes, like I say, it becomes the new normal. For Annabelle, the decision to transition and live full time as a female was made easier because her employers and her family supported her decision. But not all trans people had it that easy. People like Dan. Dan is a 42 year old trans man who transitioned over 20 years ago. Some of my family have never known. Um, so that's a bit strange because it does feel like uh, in some ways I disappeared when I transitioned. But I kind of understand that as well. I think it's about my immediate family wanting to protect me. Dan says transitioning yeah. earlier would have saved him many years of misery. I think it's really important uh, for children to know about the possibilities and the options available to them. Um, I didn't know the options, uh, which left me with a sense of my own ridiculousness. Um, I didn't know anybody who transitioned. It meant that I suffered from depression for quite a few years, through my childhood and into my adolescence. Photographs of Dan, Annabelle and other trans people are the subject of an exhibition opening in London tomorrow. With people like Dan and Annabelle becoming more visible all the time, attitudes and laws towards gender are constantly changing. Two very different journeys coming together in an exhibit helping to shed light on older transgender experiences. Ben Hunt, BBC News. Uh, morning to you. You're watching Breakfast. It's just approaching 6.15. Uh, time for a look at the headlines. New powers to stop and search people in a bid to tackle knife crime are being given to police in England and Wales, but the practice has been called intrusive. More votes on alternatives to the Brexit deal will be held in the House of Commons tomorrow as the Prime Minister works out what her next move might be to break the deadlock. So if you're just waking up and have not looked out the curtains, it is a bit chillier today. Uh, Matt has our first look at the weather for us today. And Matt, it is going to turn a bit chilly, isn't it, after those lovely temperatures we've had for the last few days? 
Oh yes, you'll certainly notice the difference, uh, Ben Victor. Very good morning to you. This was the glorious scene of the Cutty Sark in Greenwich yesterday. London reached 20 Celsius, 68 Fahrenheit during yesterday afternoon. But as Ben has already hinted at, things are on the change. And by Tuesday, most of you will be even struggling to get to around 9 degrees. April showers are on the way with the turn of the month. And that change to chilly weather has started in earnest this weekend. Through the night, we've seen a cold front working its way southwards to north of it. Widespread frost this morning across Northern Ireland, Scotland, minus five in one or two spots. Frosty a little bit towards the west of Wales, maybe southwest England, where we've got some sunshine to start the day, but lots of cloud across England, Wales. Some outbreaks of rain from our weather front across northern England. A few showers here and there, one or two in the southeast at the moment. Most of them will be dry, though the thicker cloud will be uh, hacking across southern counties of England and Wales through the afternoon. Most other parts will see some sunshine, best of which down some eastern counties of England. And through